what we have here. And the next thing is uh, we always kick these off with an organizational update by our president and CEO, Nick Pinizzato. Great opportunity for him to, to let folks know on really what's going on at NDA, you know, the newest things, because part of this is we want to share all of this with our members, give you the firsthand knowledge of all the stuff that's happening. And some of the stuff Nick's going to share with you is stuff that literally just happened today at work. So, uh, Nick, without further ado, uh, I'll turn it over uh, to you to, to share some folks or with the folks uh, some exciting information that's going on here at the National Deer Association. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. And Happy New Year, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, see a lot of new names and also some we certainly recognize. And my job is really to just give you the quick update and get out of the way so we can get on with the show. So I'll go ahead and get right into it. Uh, as you heard from our last meeting, and if you've been following our news, you've learned that Meat Eater has donated the Back 40 property to us. If you haven't seen the Back 40 show on Meat Eater, you can go check it out and get caught up on the episodes. Well, we uh, now own that property and myself and Hank Forster from our team had a chance to go out and actually spend some time on the back 40 at the end of December. And we also got a chance to, uh, to shoot some deer as well. So you'll see that coming out in an upcoming episode. I can't give the, uh, give the entire thing away, but we're very excited about what that represents for us and how we can further our field to fork program, do some conservation out there. It's just a great opportunity for education. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, we hosted, speaking of Field to Fork, we recently hosted an event for Daniel Defense employees in Georgia uh, in collaboration with the National Shooting Sports Foundation. One of the things that's been interesting with Field to Fork is finding out how many companies in the outdoors, hunting or shooting space, how many employees in those companies aren't already hunters. And Daniel Defense is one of those examples. And so we were able to take some people from that company out and uh, give them a taste of hunting. And I think we've got some people uh, engaged for life. I just saw the video from it today. It looks really good. Uh, on the policy front, we distributed four action alerts since our last beer and deer webinar. Uh, a couple of them have expired. You had opportunities in New York and Oklahoma to weigh in on some, uh, on some comments and regulations for the coming year. Uh, Virginia, uh, Sunday hunting bill, opportunity for sportsmen in Virginia to be able to hunt on public land on Sundays. Yes, believe it or not, there are still 11 states that have some form of Sunday hunting restrictions. We continue to work on that. And also some opportunity to work on some deer plan work in Wisconsin. Uh, I mentioned New York and Oklahoma are already expired. It's just a reminder to tell you, uh, if, you don't, if you aren't already signed up for our emails, please get signed up because you'll get these action alerts and we don't, want to, we don't want you to miss an opportunity to comment on something going on in your state. And the other thing I'll mention too, is that if you're aware of something and you haven't seen us put something out about it, don't assume that we know. It's also helpful to get input from people that, uh, out on the ground of things going on so we can make people aware of them. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we just hosted a uh, chronic wasting disease meeting, a national meeting that we host uh, every, every other month where we host, uh, there are state agency staff there, there are uh, scientists from across the country, uh, researchers, universities, and, and people from other nonprofit conservation orga organizations like ours. And we host that meeting to give everybody a national update on what's going on in chronic waste and disease. So that just happened just a few days ago. Uh, on, the, uh, on the home front, we just interviewed uh, three finalists for our deer outreach specialist position in Missouri. Uh, we had, uh, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but in the neighborhood of hundred applicants for that job, which we're very proud of. It tells us people wanna get engaged in this work. And so uh, the, the team had whittled that down to three and I think we're probably close to a decision there. And we also uh, have three new interns that are starting with us that'll be with us for the next six months. So uh, some new names and faces to help us advance our mission for deer. Uh, if you haven't already, you will be receiving very shortly your next issue of Quality Whitetails Magazine uh, as an NDA member. Now those, uh, one of the things I'm learning here is that uh, some people get them before others, and I'm one of the people that hasn't gotten mine yet. So uh, there you go. If, you, if you've gotten your magazine, you're ahead of some of us here on staff, and that's just the nature of getting them out into the mail. But uh, that's going to be showing up in your mailbox really soon if it hasn't already. Uh, and also, uh, Matt had already mentioned the Southeast Deer Study Group meeting. And so what I'll reiterate here is, is that this is a really, really unique opportunity for anybody to attend this. And that's not something that can typically happen. So I would say if you've ever really wanted to be uh, front and center on the, the latest, greatest deer research that's going on, this is your opportunity. Uh, this is, may not come around again uh, any, anytime soon. 
So I would say, uh, look at that if you haven't already, go to our website, it's front and center, go to deerassociation.com and you'll see what you need to know to be able to register for the Southeast Deer Study Group meeting. Uh, so please do that. And as Matt said, um, early registration ends on Friday. Uh, finally, what we're here to talk about this evening is our 2021 deer report and Kip will be giving us a thorough update on it, but uh, just to let you know that that'll be available on January 18th. Although as we were coming into the meeting, we were talking about uh, edits and things that still have to happen there. So uh, we may have to be burning the midnight oil, but whatever it takes, that's our goal to get that on on the 18th. But you, by being here this evening are one step ahead of the game because you're gonna get the highlights uh, from our own Mr. Kip Adams. So with that, I'll turn it back over and just remind everybody, reach out to me if you have a question or a comment, reach out to me directly. My email address is simple. It's just nick at deerassociation.com. And after every single one of these so far, I've had people email me with questions, which I appreciate. So let's go ahead and keep that rolling. I definitely wanna hear from you. All right, Kip, back to you. All right, you all set to take this off, Matt? I am. Let's do I it. I think we're ready. I'm excited yeah. too. Here we go. All right, folks. Uh, you are the first ones to get to see this information. Uh, brand new. If you have paid attention to our uh, annual white tail report, uh, you know this type of information is uh, the only place that you can get it is here. This is not yet available uh, online. Uh, that's going to be on the 18th, but uh, here is highlights from it. There's a lot more than uh, what I will be able to show you tonight in that, but uh, this is the highlights from that so that you can see uh, kind of what's going on and, uh, and the trends and harvest uh, around uh, the uh, country relative to both whitetail and it just see this year, Matt, a little bit expanded. Uh, this is no longer just the whitetail report. It is now the deer report. We're including some other deer species in this too. But uh, same great information, just uh, including even a little bit more than we have uh, for the past 12 years. So uh, if you are not aware of this, uh, what this is every fall or every late summer early fall Matt and I contact every single state in the lower 48 and all the Canadian provinces their deer project leader and ask them information on the prior years deer harvest age structure of that harvest the biggest issues going on in the in their state or province that year and put all this together to get a true you know state of the union address on what's going on in the deer world this is the cover for this year's report. So all of the data that I'm gonna share with you has come from the state wildlife agencies and the provincial wildlife agencies. And uh, we are so appreciative of, of the help that they give us, uh, their efforts with this. You know, we couldn't bring this without them. And uh, this truly is the, the best look at what we have, what's going on in the whitetails in the past and now even in the mule deer world um, that you know is available to the average hunter. So this is used by hunters, landowners, natural resource professionals, the media, and others. So it's a great look at how your state or province fits into your neighbors or others in your region or uh, in different regions of the country. So uh, if you're a deer nut, this is absolutely the publication uh, that you want to have. So uh, I will tell you this, uh, the, the data that I'm gonna share at times, we'll talk about regions. These are the different regions that we break these into. We provide state by state and province by province data for everything where we get the data from uh, those agencies. Um, not all of them provide it, and some provide more than others, but we do provide it on a state-by-state -state basis where we can. However, we also regionalize it. So these are the regions that, that we're discussing here. And we or developed these a long time ago, back in what, 2009, I guess, when we were putting this first one together, largely based around where the largest deer biologist meetings of the country are. So the Northeast meeting, includes the, uh, the, the state chair that you see in uh, the Northeast and as well as some Eastern provinces. The Southeast largely considers what you have here in the Midwest. So it's not exactly you know, the boundary lines that you may see with some other region, but uh, it fits very well with how these agencies collect data and how they meet with among themselves. So it fits really good within what we have. Now, if you see here, I have this black line just east of the Rocky Mountains. That's because anytime we're talking about a uh, three region total or big analyses, we're using those 37 states that are east of that line. And that's because those 37 states are home to about 97% of the whitetails in the US. And because once you get west of that line, some of those states cannot divide their harvest data between mule deer and whitetails. So when we get data from them, some of it's whitetails, 
Some of it's just mule deer, some of it's whitetails and mule deer. So it just doesn't compare as well to everything east of that line. So we're super appreciative of the folks in the West sending their data and participating. But uh, when I'm talking about different regions, um, this is a dividing line that we're gonna use for many of the analyses. So uh, last thing I'll say about the data is this is all from the, the harvest data is from the 2019 into 2020 deer season because the 2020 to 21 deer season is still going on right now for a lot of states. And I know Matt and I, we have buddies in the South that tonight are not here because they're at deer camp because their ruts are just kicking in. Where I'm in Pennsylvania and you in New York, you know, our ruts are passed and our deer seasons are largely over. But a lot of our Southern friends are just into the thick of it right now. So the data I'm gonna share from a harvest perspective is the most recent season that is complete, that the data is all analyzed by the state wildlife agencies and then has been provided to us. So one of the things we're gonna look at here, and we always monitor are, take all the other bucks harvested out there, what percentage of them are only one and a half years old? We have monitored this for a long time, and it's a really good measure of age structures that's going on in the buck harvest. And what we saw was this past year, the percentage of all the, the uh, antler bucks that got shot uh, that were one and a half years old, was only 28%. And this is the lowest national average that is ever reported. And in fact, we have been monitoring this since the late 80s. It started at well over 60%, now has dropped all the way down to less than a third. So what this means is of all the antler bucks, and this is not buck fawns because they go to the antlerless side, but of all the bucks that have antlers that are shot today, less than one out of three of them are one and a half years old. And this is largely a testament to the whole rise of the quality deer management philosophy. Some of this is based on state wildlife agencies uh, antler restrictions. Uh, a lot of this is just based on a cultural change. People now understand the value of protecting yearling bucks, or at least the majority of yearling bucks. You have to protect all of them. There's nothing wrong with shooting some of them. What you want to do, though, is protect the majority of them each year. Allow them to become two and a half and go ahead and start shooting them at two and a half if you want, because you're never going to get them all in. Some will become three and four and five years old, and pretty soon you have a really good age structure, something that's very balanced, something that's very natural. Obviously, good viewing opportunities during the summer and then tremendous opportunities to hunt them during the fall. So what we have here is just what's shown in the U.S. since 1989, and this is pretty amazing what has happened. Well, we also look at the other end of this, which is the percentage of all the buck harvests that are at least three and a half years old. So these are three and a half or older, and in the 2019-20 season, 39% of all the bucks we shot hit this age class, which this is the highest national average ever reported. This is amazing that that many are hitting this age class now. And what this means now is that hunters across the U.S. shoot far more bucks that are at least three and a half than those that are just one and a half years old. So something very, very different than what we had a couple of decades ago. And in fact, if we take a look here, I'm gonna show you a graph here just from 2001 until now. This is a percentage of all the bucks shot that are one and a half. So I kind of just showed you this on another graph. What is impressive now is let's overlay this with a percentage that are three and a half and older. And when this started in 2001, not very many were, but look where we are today. Two out of the last three hunting seasons, we have killed more bucks that are three, four, five or six years old uh, than that are just yearlings. So this is absolutely amazing. And it just lets us know we're in a very, very different place today than we were back in the early 2000s or, or certainly prior to that. All right, well, let's take a look then if we have totals here. So when I say the three regions shot, this is uh, the Northeast, the Southeast and the Midwest. So those three regions together collectively shot nearly 2.9 million antler bucks. And this was within 1% of what we shot the year before. So very, very close to that. So uh, it's a pretty high numbers. If, if you remember following through this, we're at some historical high buck harvest. And in fact, if we look at this, just the last eight seasons, um, in 2012 to 13 to 14, we really started dropping. And this across the U.S. hunters were going out of their minds. Buck harvest had dropped very low. There was some habitat loss. There were some predation issues. Oh, there's disease issues, all kinds of stuff. Well, since then, it had really recovered. And in 2017, we actually had a historically high buck harvest, record buck harvest. Well, so since then, you know, can we maintain those harvests? Well, here's what's happened really the last few years. We have come off that just a little bit, but we still have really, really high buck harvest. 
And what we should take home from this is our buck harvests are super high compared to what they had been. In some cases, this is great. Some cases, this is not so good because it's reflective of populations that are way above where uh, the habitats can support them. From a hunting end, you know, we love to see bucks. We love to shoot bucks. And right now, hunters are killing a pile of them. So let's look and see who shoots the most bucks. You know, we like to put these lists together to see kind of a where states the list in this. And uh, from the, the total harvest, we see that Texas led the, the country with killing almost half a million antler bucks. But now, Matt, this isn't exactly apples to apples comparison, right? And I know we have some friends on here from Texas tonight. Everything is bigger in Texas. A lot of deer, a lot of hunters, a lot of land. So, yeah, they, they lead the country, and that, that's a great place to be. But it's not exactly a real uh, uh, an, an analysis of kind of what's going on there because they are so big. So what we like to do then is also take a look at this buck harvest and break it down into a per square mile basis because that's a much better reflection of really what's going on. So what we see from that is suddenly the smaller states can get in on this and out of this a little bit more, a little more comparable. So what we find is that Texas doesn't lead this one. In fact, Michigan does. And uh, they shot 3.7 antler bucks per square mile. Now, uh, this is a high harvest rate, a very high harvest rate. And the, and the way we do this, folks may be wondering how the per square mile estimates come out. You know, we used to ask states how many square miles of deer habitat you have. And people or states calculate that differently. Some included ag in that, some didn't. Some included certain forested components in that, and some didn't. So uh, at NDA, what we say is, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the total area of every single state, subtract out the water bodies, and whatever's left, that's what we will use for a per square mile estimate. It's not exact. I'll agree with you. So it's, you can't exactly compare Michigan to Pennsylvania or to South Carolina. But what it does let us do is at least allows us to standardize it the best we can. And then at least it's very comparable within any given state from year to year to year. And those trends are what we're really looking for anyway. So that's how we came up with our per square mile estimates. But if we take a look at who's shooting the most deer bucks per square mile, here we go. And what's amazing here is take a look on here, you know, Pennsylvania is two, Maryland's four, New Jersey and New York are tied for fifth. So uh, that's a pretty, that's a sweet spot of the country with regards to deer. So uh, the Midwest uh, has, a, has a, a lock on a lot of cool things with deer and the Southeast does in certain parts, but uh, I'm gonna come back to this Mid-Atlantic talk here in a little bit, but uh, to show you that. So, all right, well, let's compare this to the antlerless side then because the antlerless harvest, you know, Matt, we love to shoot bucks, but the antlerless harvest is really where the rubber meets the road relative to, to deer harvest. Let us know how good we're doing. Well, those same three regions shot just over 2.8 million antlerless deer. Antlerless deer are female does, I'm sorry, adult females, as well as all the fawns. Buck fawns and doe fawns get piled into the antlerless side. And this also was within 1% of the prior year. So last year's deer season was pretty close to the one before it. Let's look at the same uh, kind of analysis that I showed you with bucks. From 12 to 14, we see this drop, which is the same. But remember, we had this huge recovery in 16 and 17 on the buck side. We did not see that on the antlerless side. And in fact, if you look at the last two seasons, antlerless seasons, it continued to drop more. This is an entirely different picture than we're seeing on the buck side. And in many cases, this is not good. Not good at all. We have an antlerless harvest that is really dropping. In some states, this is by design. Agencies have asked hunters to shoot fewer deer because of disease or loss of habitat, or in some cases, they just balance their deer over the habitat. They, they have it where they need it to be. But there's a lot of states out there today begging hunters to shoot more antlerless deer. But we're doing it from the buck end. We are absolutely not doing it from the antlerless side. And I will say this, there are some states where we can have really successful deer programs by shooting more bucks than antlerless deer each year. Places like Northern New England, Florida, and other states that just don't have that productive of deer habitat but in most of the U.S., we need to be shooting more antlerless deer than bucks each year to keep deer herds in balance with that habitat, keep them where they need to be, and keep those deer herds healthy. Well, let's look and see then who shoots uh, the most antlerless deer, just like we did on the buck side. And uh, if we take a look here, Texas actually topped the list again. Now, Texas does not always top the antlerless harvest list, uh, but it did here. Killed a pile of antlerless deer. You see Pennsylvania's up there again. Now, I tell you, Matt, we're going to take over the world. Pennsylvania's going to do it well, sooner or later. Before my That's a pretty, pretty tight race there for third and fourth, though. I'm looking at those numbers. That's that's quite a, quite astounding. 
I know it. Uh, yeah. So let's take a look at this on a per square mile basis. Let's get a little apples to apples, or at least closer to apples to apples. And uh, Texas does not lead the list here again. Uh, it'd be pretty hard, as big as that state is to do that. But if we take a look here, Delaware tops this list. And uh, I know we got some awfully staunch NDA supporters and, uh, and active volunteers in Delaware. They love to see this. So uh, Pennsylvania is up high on here again. But remember what I said about the mid-Atlantic states? Take a look at this. Delaware, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey, the top four here in the mid-Atlantic. Part of this is, is this is just a real sweet spot in the deer management world. Very productive habitat. We have a lot of access. We have a lot of hunters, a strong hunting culture. So a lot of things come together here that put a lot of venison in folks' freezers from this part of the world. And uh, I'm pretty happy to, to be from uh, Pennsylvania. But I'm taking a look at these harvest rates, just to let folks know, um, these are really, really high harvest rates, like astoundingly high harvest rates. I've been with NDA now uh, for over 18 years, first with QDMA and of course now with NDA. Prior to that, I was New Hampshire's uh, deer and bear biologist. And you know, there was places in New Hampshire and in Northern New England where, you know, we didn't even have uh, five or six standing deer uh, per square mile, you know, a standing crop of deer. So, uh, you know, many of those places just hard to make a living. It was only three or four deer per square mile. So to think that places like this are shooting over five and six antlers deer per square mile, just to let folks know from a relative standpoint, really, really high harvest rates, very high. So, all right. Well, if we put all this together, what this really means is that uh, this was a historic deer season. And I say again, because with this, in the deer world, 1999 was, was a huge year and one of the most important years ever from a deer management standpoint, because that was the first year in our history that hunters ever shot more antlerless deer than antler bucks. So 1999. So what that means is 98 was the last year where we shot more bucks than antlerless deer. However, last year was the third year in a row since that that we have flipped that and have shot more bucks than antlerless deer. If you take a look, it's just not in one region, it's across the, the country. About half of the states in the Midwest, about half in the Northeast, and about half in the Southeast are all now shooting more antler bucks than antlerless deer. And, uh, and as I said, there are some places that can be very successful with this, but uh, it is not half of the states in the country. This is not a good recipe. We are going absolutely the wrong way when it comes to this from, from a harvest perspective. So uh, I know uh, state wildlife agencies are trying to convince hunters in many cases to, to shoot more antlerless deer. And certainly from our end, we are. And, and it's not from a lack of opportunity in most places. You know, it either comes down to states uh, or hunters uh, either don't have an outlet for that venison or, you know, they don't want to use more of it. So uh, we need to do things like, you know, enhance uh, the education for folks to let them know the value of shooting another doe, or even more importantly, Matt, provide some venison donation options for them. So, uh, you know, that they either don't have to process it themselves or pay to have a process where they have a place, they can get it to a needy family. And uh, we have a lot of NDA branches, I know, participate in those. And man, that like one out of seven households in the U.S. are, are food insecure. That's a sad fact. And we have hunters that can be the heroes here and help that. So, uh, we're, we're going to do our part, and I know that our branches are certainly doing part, their parts in the communities, but uh, we need to get on this. This is something we need to, to, to help correct. Yeah. How much part, How much do you think of that is uh, education-based? You know, going back to the, like, 13, 14 years where um, there's a real fear factor associated with those seasons because the harvest was so low and hunters were so upset. Um, you know, that – and I'm asking you, I think some of it may be related to that where people really don't want to go back to, to that stage, but the need is there. I agree with you. Like we need to not be shooting an imbalance in terms of how many deer are there. Cause that's representative of what's on the ground. So it, it comes down to education. And uh, I think that's something we need to really focus on as an organization. Oh, I agree. And I think you're right. There are people certainly a little leery, you know, as those deer herds dip, you know, to not want them to dip farther. So, uh... Definitely some, some education involved there. So, all right. Well, let's, uh, with that, that's kind of where we are harvest wise right now. And kind of, you can look at once this report comes out and see exactly how your state fits in. You know, we show all of that on a per square mile basis and, you know, and how it compares to the buck side and the antler side and the last few years. So, a lot of cool data there. But let's shift gears a little bit. Let's just hit some of the current national issues and trends that are going on right now. And, uh, 
COVID is certainly a, a transnational issue right now. And now, uh, but you know, uh, I'm a big country music fan. And you know, and Barbara Mandrell is saying, you know, I was country before country was cool. And uh, we were hunters. We were wearing face masks before face masks were cool or required in public as well. And uh, so I like to think that that's pretty cool. We were way ahead of the curve when it comes to this. But uh, well, let's look at some of the big things right now going on in the deer world. And we'll start just with the COVID part of that. You know, uh, we asked state agencies uh, some information about this. And what we found was that actually last year there was five states that either placed restrictions on or they temporarily stopped selling non-resident licenses or they closed or altered some of their spring turkey or bear seasons in response to COVID last spring. You know, uh, they didn't want people coming into their states. Um, certainly they wanted people to get outside. And we've seen that with license sales increases and all that, or just go to your local sporting goods store and try to buy, a, you know, a rifle or a shotgun or, or some ammunition. Uh, people are hitting the woods, they're pressing at record rates, and that is great. But uh, there definitely was an impact on some of the spring seasons. I'm glad deer season isn't in the spring. Uh, they had this whole thing sorted out by the time the fall come around. But uh, for the first time uh, in these states, uh, first time ever for some of them, saw some, some restrictions on actually what was happening uh, for our spring hunting seasons. Even with that, there was 42 states out there. Remember, we asked this to the lower 48 uh, that actually had to move their staff to remote workstations. Uh, certainly at NDA, you and I, Matt, we've been working remotely for forever. But uh, there was a lot of state wildlife agencies that did that with their staff to keep them going. And uh, what we found is that two of those states may end up keeping some of those people there permanently. And, uh, you know, this was kind of, we look at it as a 2020 thing, but uh, there was a state uh, in the West that actually didn't return to any of their, their state agencies' offices until uh, the 1st of January. And then another state, uh, Washington, that does not expect to return until June of this year. So uh, they have really stayed remote. But uh, cool thing is they're at least adapting, you know, continuing to do the research and then handling the management that needs to be done. So uh, we get to keep chasing the, the noble uh, deer species. Uh, there's 14 states out there that expected deer processing to be a problem for their hunters this past hunting season. Most of these were in the Midwest. And this is all because of the shutdown to the beef and hog processing facilities last uh, spring because of COVID. But uh, they had such a backlog that in many places, even right now, these, uh, these facilities are booked out a year in advance. Uh, we looked at this nationally. We know that there was a lot of facilities or processors that weren't even taking venison this past year, and a lot of others that were on a very restricted basis. So uh, um, hunters uh, certainly took it on the chin in some states trying to find a place to even get their venison processed. So uh, we want to reduce all these barriers to, to help people uh, you know, not add more of them, and, uh, and this was a big one in some places. Uh, and we did see the 28 states use this crisis to create some positive opportunities, which is pretty cool, you know, for the deer program. Some more online stuff, some more educational opportunities, and uh, and a handful of other things to make it easier for hunters to get engaged, uh, to go afield. And uh, we expect a lot of those to continue. So uh, that's good. I'm glad to see that. I've taken finding the, the silver line in, uh, in a lot of this. We saw that right here in New York. I mean, we, we were running a local field to fork program through my branch and actually several New York branches got together to do it. And uh, um, prior to this year, online hunter ed was not as accessible. And uh, we mm -hmm. were able to put everybody in the state in the program through online hunter ed, which was, which was nice. Good so that, that's a positive thing. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Well, staying with the disease then, if we take a look at a, kind of a, a disease update around the country, uh, hemorrhagic disease uh, it was confirmed in 23 states last year, and uh, which is you know about half the country, but overall it was listed as a light to a moderate year. So uh, if you're in an area where we had a lot of deer impacted, uh, it probably didn't feel very light or moderate to, to you, but uh, across the country, uh, it was looked at as a light or moderate year. Uh, from the CWDN, this is in 26 states now, uh, four provinces, uh, that includes uh, the Toronto Zoo uh, in Ontario. Unfortunately, not anywhere else in Ontario that we've confirmed. Uh, Korea, Norway, and Finland. So uh, this continues to spread. More hunters continue to be impacted. And uh, we are certainly in the thick of the fight on this. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, working CWD issues, management-wise, legislative-wise, uh, educational-wise, do everything we can to help hunters from this, uh, to make sure that we have healthy deer populations that we get to hunt a long time into the future. Uh, a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of other things that are impacting deer out there. Things like bovine tuberculosis, uh, bullwinkle condition, uh, ticks and tick-borne diseases, uh, eastern equine encephalitis, fungal pneumonia, 
uh, all kinds of other things uh, that we tend to be hearing more of now than, than we did in the past. But the uh, good thing is, is at least we're in a position we can share this information with hunters and uh, so we can become a little more aware of it. Um, let's talk about something that's a little uh, more exciting or at least a little happier than that. And uh, we take a look at all the deer that are harvested and break it out by weapon type. And uh, I'll let everybody on here know, of course, this is Matt. And uh, uh, he didn't have to do this, but Matt slid me a $20 bill and asked me to, to show a picture of him uh, posing with his neighbor's buck. Uh, Matt has a really <laughs> nice neighbor. It was nice of him. Uh, he shot this. Uh, Matt happened to be coming home that night. Uh, Matt slid over there, got his picture taken with his neighbor's buck, kind of showed this off. So uh, you didn't have to pay me, Matt. I'd have been more than happy to to show this picture, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to take the $20 bill as well. Thanks for just <laughs> telling him I didn't hold it really far <laughs> out too, because that's what I was doing there. Uh, but what's amazing here is you take a look at all the deer shot in the U.S. now, about a quarter of them are taken with archery equipment, either, either a bow or crossbow. And, uh, you know, some people who are either, I'm a diehard bow hunter myself, uh, you know, I shoot a compound and I know you do as well, Matt and Nick, and a lot of our staff are diehard hunters. Um, if we, we have been really close to this whole crossbow issue and looking at this, and if folks are not archers, you know, they really get uptight about crossbows and all these other, well, really, if we take a look at this, what we're finding with this is we are killing more deer today with bows than, than ever before, a bow or crossbow, I say, kill them more in the archery season. But what we find is that it's not a whole lot of different people in many cases. It's a lot of hunters that are taking advantage of just earlier seasons, early opportunities. So uh, it's not that, uh, you know, it's all these hunters or rifle hunters or shotgun hunters are losing out on opportunity. In many cases, those are the ones that are just killing some of these deer a little bit earlier in the year. So uh, I look at it as, man, we want to get hunters in the woods. We want to introduce it to new hunters. So uh, I'm fine to share the woods across bow hunters, even though, you know, I use a compound. But uh, either way, definite increasing trend with deer being taken during the archery season and uh, something that I expect that we'll see to continue going forward. Well, uh, we asked the question this year about buck bag limits. There's some pretty interesting stuff here. What we found is today in the U.S., the average state has a two buck bag limit uh, throughout the course of the year. And this has decreased from three to two uh, during the past 10 years. So our states are actually dropping a little bit with this. And a uh, big range here, this range from one buck in about 20 different states to, to seven or more bucks in certain parts of Connecticut. So uh, if you want to kill a pile of bucks, uh, you can go to Connecticut and kill more of them there than, than any other state in the country. If you take a look at season lengths, it's amazing how these can vary across the country. And what we see with this is that the average archery season in the U.S. today is 87 days long. I'm a little jealous, Matt. That's a lot longer than our Pennsylvania archery season. Uh, the average firearm season is 37 days. That as well is a lot longer than we get. And uh, because a lot of these overlap, we actually asked, you know, the average muzzleloader season as well. But the uh, total deer season length average is 124 days, uh, ranges from 30 days in Nevada to, to almost 300 in New Jersey. And uh, man, I think my wife would like me to move to Nevada as long as I took her with me if I could only spend 30 days hunting. But uh, I can't imagine always getting to hunt for 30 days uh, a year. And, uh, you know, obviously we can't hunt that long with, with deer here in Pennsylvania, but we can add in a lot of turkey and small game and others. But uh, I tell you what, the folks in the Garden State, they, they got a good thing going on there to be able to get to hunt that many days a year. That's pretty cool. Talk about jealous, our entire season oh, shorter oh, than the oh, average oh, uh, archery season that you listed on there. I think we have sure. a, ours is just shy of 80 days. Uh, for sure. Uh, hey, we checked on fawn recruitment rates. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a little misnomer here because we think that ah, every doe has two fawns. And the reality of it is, you know, not every fawn that's a fetus, you know, is born. And when they're born, not all fawns survive to be recruited into the deer herd. And uh, in fact, it's way less than we think. And, and we've been monitoring this for a long time. And if you take a look here, this is what uh, the regional totals or averages were for 2000, 10 years later, and then almost 10 years later again. And it's, it's a pretty, pretty heavy drop through most of these regions. Some people look at this as like, oh my God, you know, the sky is falling. And, uh, this is certainly predation related in some cases, but, but not everywhere. You know, there's a really cool study out of Delaware where they really don't have any fawn predators and they find that about half of the fawns die there each year anyway. So, uh, you know, we, there's definitely a predator component to this, but, but not all those fawns taken by our predators were gonna make it anyway. This plays in a little bit to where we're not shooting nearly as many endless deer as the past. So this is kind of helping us in some places where we're not pumping as many fawns into the system. 
Now, there's also states and in, in, or, uh, counties at the other end of this where, man, deer herds are really taking it on the chin and coyotes and other things are just hammering them. So I'm not, it's not suggesting to everybody, you know, it's not a one size fits all thing here, but uh, from a national trend, uh, fawn recruitment rates are really changing and have been for the last couple of decades here. Uh, we take a look at successful hunters, and this is a fun one for us because people think that, man, you have these high bag limits and people are killing a pile of deer. That's not the reality. The reality is less than half of the hunters in the country shoot a single deer a year. And uh, it's only 43% this past year. It ranged from only 15% of the hunters in New Hampshire to, to almost 70% in South Carolina. But what I think is even more amazing, Matt, is only 17% of all the hunters in the U.S. shot more than one deer last year. And that is crazy to think that, mm -hmm. you know, that that's not, you know, understood by a lot of hunters. That's one of the reasons that we get this information and share it. But, uh, you know, it's only a fraction of the hunters and a very small one out there killing more than one deer a year. Well, hey, let's, uh, I've said we know this year we've expanded to, to other deer species and uh, we're going to continue to work mule deer. Most of our focus management wise is going to stay with the white tails, but we have been doing policy work for a while now on mule deer. We will continue to do that. So let's share some mule deer data. You know, well, we asked states with this as well. And what we found is that mule deer are actually being managed through hunting with at eight states in the West, uh, four states in the Midwest and two states in the Southeast. And these are the ones closest to the West if you look at the Southeast and Midwest states. But uh, I bet you there's a lot of folks that didn't realize that six states uh, east of the Rockies where we have a uh, huntable mule deer population. And of course, uh, none here in the Northeast. And now from a mule deer perspective, uh, populations are stable or increasing in most of the states that they inhabit. And uh, in Colorado is actually home to the largest mule deer herd. Uh, they estimate they have just under 400,000 mule deer there. So, uh, Hey, cool. So if you're looking for a place to go mule deer hunting, uh, Colorado is certainly a really, really good place to, to go and, uh, and some, some pretty easy place to get tags as well. Well, let's end here then with, uh, with a few deer uh, harvest statistics and uh, we'll see who's really up on harvest wise uh, by method in their states. I'm going to show you three different methods and we'll look at the states that shoot a higher percentage of their deer with that method than anything else. So we'll stop with a bow. And when I say top bow harvest states, I mean the states that shoot the highest percentage of their total deer harvest with archery equipment. And I tell you what, year in and year out, New Jersey leads this. They are always way over 50%, and partly because they are, you know, the most urbanized state, a lot of deer, high bar or bag limits, lots of opportunity, but also a lot of firearm ordinances. So archery is the only thing that's available in many cases. But uh, these states here uh, perennially harvest a high number, with archer so great places out uh, to take your bow uh how about from a muzzleloader end uh, any guesses on who is the top muzzleloader states out there uh this actually led our list uh, last year as well and it was rhode island and if you take a look here in many cases these states lead this list because these are the best opportunities to shoot an antler this deer in some of these states my home state of pennsylvania we have lots of opportunity with rifles so uh not nearly the muzzleloader component but uh, with these states, in many cases, if you want to get an antlerless deer, it's with a bow or a muzzleloader. So uh, folks are flocking to those muzzleloader seasons, and they have some really, really cool muzzleloader hunts uh, in these states. Well, if we take a look at the last one, then, either from the, this is from the firearms, either a rifle or a shotgun harvest. So uh, some crazy numbers that we see on here. We got some western states come into this one. But uh, South Carolina and Texas, we got some eastern or some southern stuff here as well. So uh, not a lot of bow hunting going on in these particular states. So a high, high harvest rates uh, with rifles and, and to a lesser extent shotguns going on here. So uh, you can take a look once this comes out and see exactly how your state fits into any of these. But uh, with that, I'll remind everybody, this is all from this year's report. The state wildlife agency deer project leaders are right now reviewing this data out of professional courtesy. We send it all back to them give them several days to review it to make sure we have it correctly, that we haven't misprinted something or misinterpreted something. They will get it back to us by the end of this week. We will have it revised, corrected, and this will be on our website, so deerassociation.com. It'll be a free download Monday morning. So a week from today, everybody can go and get this for free, as well as all of the other reports are on there right now. You can go and grab any one of those that, that you want with all of this information. And uh, with that, this is how you can get a hold of me. I am happy to answer questions at any point. 
email me, call me or whatever about something that I've showed here tonight or, or anything else deer or, or habitat or hunter related. And with that, Matt, we got a, a bunch of time left here for questions. So uh, how about uh, I will stop sharing here. We'll kick it back so uh, the folks will see us. And uh, do we, if we have some questions there, uh, you can go ahead and call some out and uh, I'll see if uh, I can do at least a, a marginal job going ahead and answering some of that. So uh, what do we got? Hopefully we got something good. Sure. The, the first question that came in a few minutes ago, and by the way, great job, Kip. I love the, I love the overview. Obviously, I'm involved with writing uh, a good fair amount of it, and we have other staff that contribute quite a bit as well. But um, I always like seeing a summary and some of the graphs. Um, we got some questions rolling in already. So, folks, if you have a question, don't forget, we got a prize we're going to give away. I'm going to call out here in a second. Um, uh, I'm scrolling back a little bit. Rob Kresge asked, what's the other method in terms of uh, weapon use? Um, I, I answered a little bit on the chat feature, but a firearms, a shotgun, rifle only, but what type, types of things usually are categorized under the other category? Most of that falls into pistol. Um, so most of the states now will include their crossbow in with the archery. So uh, um, at one point, some of that, they would include crossbow into that part of it, but uh, most of that is pistol. Um, if there's any other questions, please type them in. I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling. And I actually don't see much. Chris Thurman commented. He said, FYI on bag limits, George's bag limits been two bucks for about the past 30 years. We don't really see much shift, uh, over time in bag limits. I mean, it's, it's declined a little bit, but not, not a, a lot. Um, so appreciate that comment, Chris. Um, William Litz asked, what level of involvement does NDA have with Michigan's TB zone? We have, we have a great working relationship with the Michigan DNR. We have some really strong uh, volunteers in, in our branches there that work very closely with the DNR there on some of that collection and, and encouraging folks to have those deer sampled. So uh, we don't do any of the sampling ourselves, but uh, we are strong advocates for having those samples done reporting those, sharing that information with the hunters. And we have some extremely passionate volunteers in that area that are, that are right in the thick of that, convincing hunters to, to, you know, to take more antler this deer in those areas to help keep that uh, disease prevalence very low. Yeah, and I'll add to that. We, we've been monitoring it this year. We saw um, with a few, a few things with the, the TB cases in Michigan. Right now, that's the only state that currently has an active bovine tuberculosis um, it, within a deer herd. Um, there are other states where it's been found, but it's been eradicated. But uh, for those not from Michigan, earlier this year, some, some folks from the wildlife disease uh, unit that do a lot of the testing came down with a form of tuber tuberculosis. So the state uh, started reducing sampling because the, the prevalence rate really hadn't changed in a lot of years in terms of how many deer they were going to sample just to minimize the exposure to the staff there. Mm -hmm. um, However, um, a report of some being found in, in uh, another new location there kind of sparked some interest to get some more testing done. So if you do, William, live in that area or if you, if you know folks in that area, um, I would say follow uh, the state's guidelines in terms of any of the things that they're recommending and, and we're kind of trying to keep a close tab on it. All right, Kip, we got lots of questions now are rolling in. Um, hey, Matt, let me say one thing here. I see a question from Mark asking about, you say he lives in North Florida. He asked about antlers harvest. Uh, Mark, I, I didn't, if I did say it, I did not mean to say that that you can't withstand an antlers harvest program. What I'm saying is the uh, uh, productivity of many of Florida's deer herds aren't as high as much of the rest of the country. So there are a lot of places in Florida where you do not need to shoot more antlerless deer than antler bucks. Um, so, but yes, you absolutely can be harvesting antlerless deer. The need to shoot as many there just isn't as great as some of the other areas more north of you that just have a lot more productive habitats. So, uh, but no, you definitely can be shooting antlerless deer there. You can just be very successful at shooting a lower number of antlerless deer. All right, Kip, here's a question from Todd. What, what's the fawn recruitment rate that's necessary to sustain a healthy herd? He thought 48%, which was uh, 
I think that was the national average, seems lowered to him. So what, what do we need in terms of a fawn recruitment rate to have a healthy population? Well, it, it really depends on what the level of, of adult deer uh, mortality is. So you, there's not an, an exact percentage with that. In areas where you are shooting a much higher percentage of your adult does, then you need a higher fawn recruitment rate to be able to replace those animals. In areas where you're not losing a lot of adult deer or maybe don't have a lot of disease, you know, you can you can easily withstand those deer herds with much lower reproduction. And in fact, there's a lot of states, take Pennsylvania right now. Pennsylvania's annual recruitment rate, I believe, is less than 50% right now. But still, you know, we have growing deer herds in Pennsylvania. So um, so that national average, that will allow deer herds in, in many cases, you know, to continue to grow and, and grow very strongly. So uh you know, in areas where you shoot a lot more, you have to be able to replace them with more. But um, yeah, they're still extremely productive deer herds, even where you have less than 50% recruitment rates. I'm going to jump over to James, come back to you, James. Eric says, or asks, shall we, we focus on predator hunting to help increase fawn recruitment? Um, Ma'am, focus on predator hunting to have a really good time, but uh, not to increase fawn recruitment. There's been a lot of work on that in, uh, in almost every case. Um, you're not improving fawn recruitment by removing a bunch of predators long term. They have areas where they'll remove a lot, you get a bump in fawn recruitment, and literally the next year, the predator populations are right back, your fawn recruitment goes to where it was. And really, outside of the western U.S. or the western, even Midwest, it's very, very open. Outside of that, you really can't hunt predators enough to, to make a difference. So what I tell folks is enhance the habitat, give those fawns a better place to hide, give them better opportunity. But outside of that, man, I love to trap. I like to hunt predators, do it, but do it for the enjoyment of hunting and trapping, not because you're gonna make a measurable impact from the fawn recruit side. Very good. Leslie asks, uh, when we report harvest, there's no category for age. Where does QDMA get the age group? I'll handle that, Kip. And then uh, I'm going to kick it back to James's question that has to do with age as well. So Leslie, where age comes in, the states uh, vary in how they collect that. Um, some of them have mandated check stations, but fewer and fewer states and provinces require that. Um, most states collect, we actually wrote this in, in a, a report within the last couple of years where states gather their, their harvest age data uh, specifically, but most of them gather it from doing checks, um, either going to taxidermist shops, going to butcher shops and basically checking a sample, a small percentage of the deer that are harvested, um, looking at the tags on those deer, recording the age based on the teeth, and just like with any election, um, they only need to reach a certain percentage. So when, when uh, you're watching election results coming in, maybe not this year, uh, talking about percentages that are, that are gonna meet and they can call who's gonna win that election prior to that, the total vote coming in, it's just basically a sample. So the state can collect if there's 150,000 bucks killed, if they collect somewhere around 1,500 to uh, 3,000 deer and actually get their hands on those deer, they have a, a percentage of that that uh, snapshot and they can actually make predictions of what it would be across the board. So that's where most of them come in. If you wanna check that out, um, I can share with the group here, I'll look in a second uh, while Kip's answering James's question, what report that was in, uh, but we wrote exactly which states and how they collect the age data in a previous report. Um, I think that was last year, Matt. I think was it, was, it? Uh, if it, was either, it was either the 20 report or the 19. I, I think it was last 19. Year. Um, it's, I'll look it's definitely real quick. One of the other. James says, how did Wisconsin fare in the one and a half versus three and a half year old category? Because many years they lead the, the one and a half in the harvest. Do you happen to remember that offhand? I, I have it right here. We can take a look that uh, they actually led the, the country in percentage of yearlings again at 52% of the buck harvest was one and a half. All right. Um, we got, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. There's a lot of questions rolling in now. Uh, Tanya, where's the registration for the Southeast Deer Study Group? Just go to deerassociation.com. One of the main banners will come up will be the Southeast banner. You click on that registrations on that page. If you can't find that, if you go to the, to the conservation menu, it's within that section. Um, Mel asks, 
when it comes to CWD, is it more important to shoot dozer bucks? And is it more important to shoot yearling bucks or mature bucks? That's a big question, Kip. I'll let you handle that. That's a that great one. question. Um, you know, a lot of agencies focus on the, the buck side of that because bucks have a higher prevalence rate of CWD than does. Um, if it is a brand new outbreak in an area, maybe we just found it for the first deer or we just found it the first time. In many cases, you know, you will focus on bucks because they're often the first ones we see that in. Um, however, once CWD becomes established in a population, um, what happens, you know, those does are right there. They live in family groups. Uh, research out of Wisconsin shows that if, if there is one adult doe that's infected, any of her kin that are living right there with her are 10 times more likely to be infected than other deer in that area. So uh, once you have this in your area for a while, um, in my opinion, and in, in NDA's opinion here, it is far more important to keep that focus on the doe side. That means doesn't mean forget about the bucks by any means, but don't put all of that harvest effort on the bucks. It's even more important to be shooting those does so that you're keeping that infection from becoming, you know, or that area from being a disease reservoir. You don't want those deer herds to grow too high and spread it. So it's very important to be shooting bucks and does, but in my opinion, way too much effort gets flipped over on the buck side. So uh, we absolutely have to keep shooting does there so that we don't become reservoirs and because those deer herds stay in balance or let those habitats can support. So uh, extremely important to not forget about the does. And actually I have an article on our website, Matt, that's the title of that was, you know, let's not forget about the does. And uh, with, with big reasons on, on why we need to focus on that with, with more information than, uh, than I was just able to share there. I look, I look back and uh, we actually had a chapter in the 2020 and the 2018 report. The 2020 report had the differentiation between private and public land and where those sources came from. And the 2018 report was how and where they collect that. So it's actually a combination of two different years. Um, Kip, we're coming up on 756. How many more questions do you want to answer? Because we got a, at least 20 in here that, that uh, you want to do one or two more? Uh, yeah, I'm sure folks are going to want to go watch the football game. Yeah. And all this. So uh, let's, let's go right to eight o'clock. And then uh, um, then any of the questions that we don't get answered, if, if folks just want to email me directly, I'll, I'll answer every single one of them after that. But uh, we told folks we'd get them out at eight. So let's do that. And, and we will, if you typed a question in, we, we will answer that Um to you if you've if you've done that all right so next question is why aren't earn a buck requirements working to increase doe harvest better by gary and gary great question actually earn a buck works extremely well to increase antlerless harvest um just the the, the truth is they're very un, unpopular with hunters and uh and agencies just don't tend to use them uh there's a handful of agencies out there or state wildlife agencies right now that do use those in certain parts of their state Nobody uses them statewide. And, and I think there's about 10 states that do use them. They are extremely effective at increasing the endless harvest. What typically happens is hunters don't like them. They complain to their legislators. Legislators put the pressure on the state wildlife agencies and then the state wildlife agencies have to stop using them. Uh, that's unfortunate because that is by far the single best method out there that's available to deer managers to in increase endless harvest. Very good. Kip, there's a question on use of drones. Um, do we have any comments on that? And I'm trying to, you might remember off the top of your mind, uh, your head, which one we had on drone use. That was within the last three years too, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think that was two. I think that was in 19. Um, yep. You know, and I'll tell you folks uh, on our website, if you go to the, the deer reports or the formerly the whitetail report, but now the deer report uh, link, there's actually an interactive index where we have listed by topic every single article in all of these. So, uh, you know, you can go there and find drones and then it will take you exactly to that. But uh, our policy on them is uh, we're all about fair chase. So uh, we surveyed states to see who allows them during the hunting season, who allows them for scouting. Uh, what you're seeing is, you know, a lot of increased use of those and we're starting to see a lot of the laws catch up to them. You know, and they were they were ahead of the curve with regard to what people could do versus laws that, that were a little restrictive. So uh, we uh, we monitor that closely. You know, we want to see people be able to recreate and have fun. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, we're here for the resource first. So uh, we don't want any unfair use for the resource. So uh, I, I've used them for uh, for photos and stuff. I think they're pretty cool. But, uh, you know, from a hunting end, uh, there's definitely uh, some some unethical hunting could be had with them. So we're glad to see states, you know, put a little restriction on that. Uh, we got a question on events. I'll come back to that real quick. There's a question on 
Uh, Ohio reported their first case of CWD in the wild this year from, looks like Clayton. How many other states reported their first occurrence of CWD in the wild this year? Oh, off the top of my head, uh, I don't, I don't Thanks. know that there's not any brand new state in total. Um, all the states that have reported new counties within this given year had it in the past. Um, I can't remember if there's another state that only had it in captivity besides Ohio or not. Uh, I know there was no new states added to that list, though. Yeah, I agree. Uh, one thing I was going to add to that um, is that we update the layer in Onyx in real time. As we hear about the counties um, that become CWD positive or have new uh, new occurrences, we update it and that, that gets updated in real time. Um, Nick and mentioned at the very beginning of this seminar, our CWD roundup that, that we do every other month. Um, you can find that on the website as well. Um, and that's a, um, a bi-monthly update of what has been found on CWD. And we can, we can share that link with you as well. So Kip, we're coming up to eight o'clock. Um, I hate to, to cut it off. There's a lot, there's 22 messages I haven't even read. So I think there's a lot of questions here, okay. but. I, you know, you haven't given your prize away. Let's go ahead and give your prize away. We yep. will get to the, uh, we will answer, Was there, as I guess, as long as we have the folks' email addresses, uh, we can, we'll make sure that we get those. And actually, yeah, we do through the registration process. So yeah, yeah. We will answer all of those. Um, you know, if anybody, obviously, I said, can email me or they can email you or any of us, but uh, you better give a prize away uh, as yep. we promised and uh, let people uh, go watch some football tonight. All right. So I got the prize right here. Kip, you want to mention about upcoming webinar first? Sure. Next month, uh, we'll have Dr. Craig Harper from the University of Tennessee, a fan Ooh. favorite of, uh, of NDA members, um, talking about what else. We're going to be talking about habitat. It's going to be talking about forest stand improvement in hardwoods for deer. So, uh, of course, he's always at the forefront of research with his graduate students and, uh, you know, great speaker, great personal friend of all of ours. And uh, there are very few people in, in the country that are better uh, at this than what he does. So uh, I absolutely, I'm going to be the first one in line to register for next month, but uh, this is going to be a good one. It's the first real habitat focused one we've had like this. So uh, it's going to be a great way to kick off uh, the new year from a habitat end. Is he at the forefront of technology though? Will, 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 he, you think oh, he'll he be will. able to figure he out is. Zoom? Yeah, he will. Uh, he's, uh, he's there. So he's all set. All right. That's good. Hopefully he's on and he heard me say that. All right. Prize. I am holding a hard copy of the last five years worth of uh, deer reports or white tail reports. So uh, 2016 through 2020, um, the prize is going to be these. I will mail this to whoever answers the question first. And then you will also get a hard copy of the 2021 deer report. Uh, we will get your information and we'll add it to our outgoing list of once it's printed, you'll get that in the mail as well. So um, here's my question. Hey, we'll do this, Matt. So before you say it, yeah. make sure they know the first person to answer it on the chat. On the chat. And if, you, and if you're the winner, make sure that you email Matt your mailing address so that, that he can get this to you. That's correct. That's correct. All right. So my question is, how many states were identified with EHD or epizootic hemorrhagic disease this year? Let's see if anybody gets this right. Oh, boy. oh, I see some right ones. Who was first? I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. Oh, I see it's Mariah. Oh, Mariah. Congratulations. Mariah. Congratulations, Mariah. The first one to type in, 23 mm -hmm. states were identified with EHD this year. That's epizootic hemorrhagic disease. Um, figured I'd keep it short and simple. There's lots of things I could have asked. I wrote down lots of facts and figures, but uh, Mariah, uh, Send me your, your physical mailing address at matt at deerassociation.com and I will uh, I'll ship these right out to you. What else have we got, I, Kip? I think that's about it, Matt. Uh, I certainly appreciate everybody being here tonight. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the information that we shared. Man, we have a good time putting it together uh, from a staff perspective and sharing this with you. Uh, we're in a unique position to be able to do it, and uh, we appreciate our partners at the, the state wildlife agencies and the provincial the wildlife agencies that they give it to us and uh, man we love bringing it to you so uh i hope the folks like it and uh for those of you that are still deer hunting good luck man matt and i are rooting for you i'll assure you that's right have a good night everybody we All appreciate right. your time and your support cheers we'll see you next month